The subject of today's session is the upcoming biblical holiday, which admittedly is an especially enigmatic one. Not because the Torah doesn't tell us anything about it. On the contrary, it does. It tells us a lot about this holiday, but the challenge is how to reconcile the various statements that seem to be completely different from one another. Now, since there are five passages in the Torah in which this holiday is explicitly presented, I'd like to begin with a quick overview of those five passages. We'll need to discuss them at length. And in addition, another two passages that do not mention this holiday explicitly, but that are, as I hope we'll see, nevertheless directly relevant to our understanding of it. So, we begin with the first instance in which the holiday appears, and that is in Exodus chapter 23. Now, the context, as you can see in Exodus chapter 23, verse 14, is the three pilgrimage festivals. Three times you shall keep a feast unto me in the year, and they are, in verse 15, the feast of unleavened bread, and in verse 16, we read of another two festivals, the feast of harvest, the first fruits of your labors which you sow in the field. Then there's the third, the feast of ingathering at the end of the year. And in verse 17, once again, stressing three times in the year, all your males shall appear before God the Lord. So this is the initial presentation. Again, the feast of unleavened bread, the feast of harvest. That's what the second festival is called here, and the Feast of Ingathering. Now, 11 chapters afterward, in Exodus chapter 34, we read about the festivals once again, and two are familiar. In chapter 34, verse 18, we read again about the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We also read in verse 22 of the Feast of Ingathering. Those two are familiar. But the middle festival, also mentioned in verse 22, seems, based upon its name, to be something completely new. And you shall make for yourself the feast of weeks, even of the first fruits of wheat harvest. And inevitably, we can't help but note, this is not, at least by name, the festival to which we were introduced in chapter 23, in verse 16, when it was the Feast of Harvest. Well, of course, we recognize that there are certain similarities. Harvest, after all, does appear in both. In Exodus chapter 23, it's the Feast of Harvest. There is, however, reference to the wheat harvest in Exodus chapter 34 as well. Moreover, there is reference to the first fruits in chapter 34, the first fruits of wheat harvest, and albeit in a somewhat different order, we did read in chapter 23, verse 16, of the first fruits of your labors. So we do see some similarity, but the names are clearly different, especially the name that is primary in chapter 34, verse 22, is the Feast of Weeks. We never heard about a Feast of Weeks before at all. Not only that, at this stage, in Exodus chapter 34, we really haven't a clue what the very expression Feast of Weeks even means. But, nonetheless, we'll get to clarification of that very shortly, we can appreciate that this must be the same holiday Besides the commonality of motifs, after all, at the end of the passage, 
in verse 23, we read once again, three times in the year, shall all your males appear before God, the Lord, the God of Israel. And of course, inevitably, we recognize that in as much as two of those three festivals are clearly identified with the exact same expression, as we saw in Exodus chapter 23, this third one must correspond to the Feast of Harvest that we saw there. But it seems awfully strange. Why indeed have the names changed? Before we attempt to answer any of these questions, we continue our survey of the five passages where the festival explicitly appears. The next is in Leviticus, in chapter 23. And here we can't help but note that in seeking a name of the festival, well, there's no name here at all. The closest we've got is in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 21, and you shall make proclamation on the self same day, there shall be a holy convocation unto you, you shall do no manner of servile work, it is a statute forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations. But what's it called? No answer here. The reason that I did note that Leviticus chapter 23 is a crucial clarification of the name that we saw in Exodus chapter 34 is because it is, of course, in, Exodus, in Leviticus chapter 23 that we also read of the counting of the seven weeks. That is, in chapter 23, verse 15, you shall count unto you from the morrow after the day of rest, which in context is the first day of Passover, from the day that you brought the Omer of the waving, the Omer being a measure that corresponds to the normal consumption of a person on a day. You count seven weeks, seven Sabbaths, and it is after these seven weeks that this festival happens. So we can well appreciate why then it is identified in Exodus chapter 34 as the Feast of Weeks. We needed to get to Leviticus chapter 23 in order to understand that. But again, I'm going to reiterate, there is no name here at all. Just again, a holy convocation, unnamed. We move on to the fourth passage where this festival appears. That is in Numbers chapter 28. And we do find, to a degree, familiar motifs. But simultaneously, we also find something that is still distinctive. In Numbers chapter 28, we read of the day of the first fruits. Now, again, we have seen the theme of first fruits previously, but that was never a name of this festival. We also read of your feast of weeks, which, of course, is the name that we encountered for the first time in Exodus chapter 34, even though it wasn't mentioned at all in the first appearance of the holiday in Exodus chapter 23. And finally, in Deuteronomy chapter 16, where we read once again of the cycle of the festivals, we read in the first verse about keeping the Passover offering, and then in verse 9, we read about the count of seven weeks. And the following verse, verse 10, you shall make the feast of weeks unto God your Lord after the measure of the free will offering of your hand. So here it is, the Feast of Weeks. And what is, of course, significant here, besides referring to it as the Feast of Weeks, is none of the other motifs appear here at all. Nothing about harvest, nothing about first fruits, simply the Feast of Weeks. So, of course, inevitably, when we consider the variety of expressions, the fact that this holiday seems to evolve in its name 
over the course of the various passages in the Torah, culminating here in Deuteronomy, where once again, in verse 16, in the summation of the three pilgrimage festivals, it is only known as the Feast of Weeks. We need to understand what's taking place here. What does this mean? Okay, so now that we've had an opportunity to see these five passages, again, I reiterate, there are still another two oblique references to this holiday that we need to discuss. But these are the five places where it appears explicitly. Inevitably, we need to understand what's going on here. And I think a good place to begin is when we consider what is perhaps the most glaring anomaly and that is, as we saw, the difference between Exodus chapter 23 and Exodus chapter 34. I mean, after all, we're speaking of a disparity of only 11 chapters. And besides the glaring question that we've already raised, why is this holiday described in two completely different ways? We can't help but ask a more basic question. Why altogether? Do we need another passage describing the same holidays in much the same vein after a space of just 11 chapters? We read about holidays before in chapter 23. Why repeat them? We should note that with the exception, of course, of Genesis, which is prior to the nation of Israel being charged by God with the commandments in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, each we read about the cycle of the biblical holy days. We already noted in Leviticus is chapter 23. In Numbers, it is from chapter 28 and on. In Deuteronomy, it's chapter 16. Why in Exodus? Are there two such passages, both chapter 23 and again in chapter 34? But of course, upon reflection, the answer to this question is obvious. Because of what happened between chapter 23 and chapter 34, in particular, what happened in chapter 32. The debacle of the sin of the golden calf. Israel not merely sinned, but in effect broke the covenant that Israel had made with God. Now, part of that covenant that, after all, encompasses the way of life that God prescribes for Israel in the Torah is, of course, the cycle of the Holy Day that we read in Exodus chapter 23. But that covenant was sundered. In Exodus chapter 34, after God forgives Israel and reestablishes the covenant that had been broken, we read, of course, once again about the principal components of the covenant that had been broken, as it is here re-established by God. So repeating the cycle of the holy days in Exodus chapter 34 is by no means a redundancy. It's a new, renewed covenant between God and Israel after the sin and the repentance and God's forgiveness. And maybe once we appreciate this point, we could also appreciate why the change of names with respect to this festival. There are admittedly a number of additional differences between the passages in Exodus chapter 23 and Exodus chapter 34. And I think they all are a reflection of this crucial insight of the renewed covenant, but focusing for our purposes on the way this festival is described 
in chapter 23, verse 16, it was the Feast of Harvest. Now, of course, it should be obvious to all of us that what God is ordaining in Exodus chapter 23 is not some pagan harvest festival. On the contrary, the harvest necessarily always needs to be seen as means, like everything in the physical world is means, to a spiritual end. So, of course, we should realize that the Feast of Harvest means an opportunity to deepen our connection with God, an opportunity to bring ourselves to life spiritually to a greater degree. That should be obvious. But maybe after the sin of the golden calf, even what should have been obvious needs to be spelled out more clearly. The problem in speaking about a feast of harvest is when you consider what the words are saying, they're only talking about something that is happening to you. That is, while undoubtedly the farmer invested arduous efforts throughout the entire growing season in rearing his crops, once it's time for the harvest, not to belittle the effort involved in harvesting the bounty of the earth, still and all, it's really what you're getting rather than what you are investing, what you are doing. And there might be a misconstrued inference that the Feast of Harvest is all about something that's happening to you. And you're just a passive participant. When we identify the holiday, on the contrary, as the Feast of Weeks. So, of course, again, as we noted, the Feast of Weeks only becomes clear when we get to Leviticus chapter 23 and we consider the commandment. The commandment after bringing the Omer offering, the Omer of the waving, that you have a commandment to number 50 days. We've discussed the counting of the Omer, this commandment, separately. We're not going to discuss it right now, but what's crucial for us to remember is it's something that you do proactively. It's not something that's done to you. And indeed, this counting is in order to drive home the process that is taking place by dint of your efforts in you, you grow, you develop spiritually, you ready yourself for this additional festival that takes place after the seven weeks of counting. This feast of weeks is a result of your spiritual effort. It's not something that is merely done to you. It's something for which you need to ready yourself actively. And by the same token, in accentuating, not merely as we saw it in Exodus chapter 23, the first fruits of your labors, but specifically the first fruits of the wheat harvest, we also inevitably call our attention to the difference between the holiday from which we began to count, and this one. What was described as the beginning of the harvest and the context that determines the start of the count of these seven weeks, it's even more explicit, we'll note, in Deuteronomy chapter 16, in verse 9, seven weeks shall you number from the time the sickle is first put to the standing corn, to the grain. You shall begin to number seven weeks. The beginning of the harvest is not the wheat harvest. Anyone familiar with the agricultural cycle in the land of Israel knows that very well. And as we will note at greater length a little bit later in this session, it's also explicit at the end of the first 
and second chapters of the book of Ruth, that the barley harvest is the first harvest. Wheat comes only afterward. The barley harvest is at the beginning of this process, the beginning of this count, the beginning of this growth. When we consider the implications with respect to the Feast of Weeks, it is inevitably something that pertains directly to the first fruits of the wheat harvest. Now, the reference to the wheat harvest isn't really clear in Exodus chapter 34 by itself either. But then we have Leviticus chapter 23, verse 17, to clarify what wheat has to do with it. You shall bring out of your dwellings two wave loaves of two tenth parts of an ephah. They shall be a fine wheat flour. The Hebrew, solet, specifically refers to wheat. They shall be baked with leaven for first fruits unto God. The first fruits of the wheat harvest, specifically, also drive home this realization. As we've noted, barley is the beginning. Barley is, for the most part, considered animal food. The wheat harvest is for human consumption. The wheat accentuates the process in which you need to engage. It's not something that happens to you. It's something that happens through you and in you. That transformation that readies you to give thanks to God in the Feast of Weeks. Truth is, it could very well be that it is for this very reason that in Leviticus chapter 23, we don't read a name of this holiday. Just, you shall make proclamation on the selfsame day. There shall be a holy convocation unto you. Because the name is the name we already learned in Exodus chapter 34. That Leviticus chapter 23, in this vein, is an elaboration upon, an explanation of, a fleshing out of the themes that are made explicit in Exodus chapter 34. Now again, we'll note that the underlying principle is doubtlessly implicit in referring to the festival as the Feast of Harvest in Exodus chapter 23. You might have understood that, but then again, after the sin of the golden calf, maybe not. And maybe it needs to be further accentuated, further driven home. And so, from this point and on, we see the principle of this being a feast of weeks becoming more and more accentuated. In Numbers chapter 28, in your feast of weeks. In Deuteronomy chapter 16, again, as we noted, it is the feast of weeks alone that appears. It's exclusively described in terms of what you need to be doing. So, of course, granted, it is, after all, after the sickle is first put to the standing corn. So there is a harvest implicit here, but we're not talking about the harvest. We're talking about the weeks. We're not focusing upon what would be the goal of the materialist. The materialist counts to the harvest. We are bidden to count from the beginning of the harvest to something greater. The spiritual goal toward which ultimately everything needs to be directed. Now, there is this additional theme besides weeks that becomes most accentuated in Numbers chapter 28. And as we've noted, the theme of the first fruits is one that appears in every instance in which the holiday appears, aside from Deuteronomy. That is, again, we did find in Exodus chapter 23, verse 16, that this holiday is the first fruits of your labors. And in chapter 34, the first fruits of the wheat harvest. Note how 
the theme of the harvest is subordinated to the first fruits in chapter 34, whereas the, far, the harvest was the principal theme in chapter 23. In Leviticus, in as much as the theme of the weeks predominates, the first fruits don't take the central focus, but we do, of course, see repeatedly that the meal offering brought on this holiday is first fruits unto God. When we consider what the significance of the first fruits is, culminating again in Numbers 28, the day of the first fruits, inevitably, we need to consider the first of our oblique references to this holiday. And that brings us to Deuteronomy chapter 26. Now, again, I'm going to stress, Deuteronomy chapter 26 makes absolutely no reference at all to this holiday. But it is all about the first fruits. Because we read in chapter 26, when you come into the land that God is giving you for an inheritance, you shall take of the first of all the fruit of the ground, which you bring in from your land that God your Lord gives you, and you shall put it in a basket and shall go unto the place that God your Lord shall choose to cause his name to dwell there. And what follows, beginning in verse 3 and continuing all the way through verse 10, is a very precisely dictated ceremony in which you come into the holy temple and you make a declaration before God. I profess this day unto God, your Lord, you say to the priest that I am come unto the land that God swore unto our fathers to give us. And you continue with a statement that begins here in verse 5, speaking in a few terse sentences of the whole progress of the history of Israel from the forefathers through the bondage in Egypt and through ultimately being brought to this place, the land, the land flowing with milk and honey. And it is first and foremost a statement of thanksgiving to God. It culminates with, and now behold, I have brought the first of the fruit of the land which you, O God, have given me. And you sit down before God your Lord and prostrate yourself before God your Lord. The theme of the first fruits, once again, is you take the physical. These are the physical fruits, but they are not an end in themselves. They are a means to something that goes beyond the physical. They are means to the spirit. Now, there's a particularly significant motif that I feel obligated to emphasize with respect to the first fruits. And it is perhaps most explicitly articulated in chapter 26, verse 2. And that is that you take the first of all the fruit of the ground which you bring in from your land that God your Lord gives you. Specifically, the fruit of the land of Israel. And indeed, in our ancient traditions, this is an imperative. The offering of the first fruits comes only from the land and specifically from the species that are associated with the land of Israel. As we read in Deuteronomy chapter 8, when specifically in the context of speaking of the good land that God is bringing us to enter, we read in chapter 8, verse 8, that this is a land of wheat and barley and grapevines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of oil, olive trees, and date honey. The seven species with which the land of Israel is praised. And I must admit that in 
considering why specifically the first fruits are brought from only these species, there is an obvious question. These are not the only species that are associated with the land. Just consider, in the continuation of Leviticus chapter 23, we read of the fruit of goodly trees and branches of palm trees and boughs of thick trees and willows of the brook, the four species that we use to rejoice before God during the holiday of tabernacles. Explicitly speaking, in a very different passage of the produce with which the land of Israel is praised, in Genesis chapter 43 and verse 11, Israel, Jacob, says to his sons on their way back to the enigmatic and scary ruler in Egypt, take the choice fruits of the land in your vessels and carry down the man a present. A little balm, a little honey, spicery, and ladanam, and almonds. That is, again, species that are a completely different list from those seven from which we bring the first fruits. So what's so special about these seven species? I feel compelled to share with you an idea that was told to me quite a number of years ago pertaining to the botany and agriculture of the land of Israel. And that is, without belaboring you with the details, that these seven species are all particularly vulnerable to the changeable weather that we have here in the land of Israel especially during the period between Passover and the Feast of Weeks and Shavuot. This is a period in which, as anyone who has been in Israel at this time of year can readily attest, the weather often changes suddenly and precipitously. From very cold to very hot, there can be periods of scorching heat, followed by rain, a very strange and very fickle time of year. And these species are, for various reasons, very sensitive to these changes. As a result, the pagan Canaanites who dwelt in this land before Israel had developed a whole formula of complex rituals that were intended to secure the blessings of the gods in providing their bounty with respect to these species. Now, of course, it would be tempting to say, well, that's the reason that God specifically ordains that we bring the first fruits into the holy temple from these very species in order to emphasize that we are not like the pagans who were in this land before us, that rather than develop rituals and ceremonies in order to secure the bounty of the gods, we bring them into the holy temple in thanksgiving to the one God for the bounty of the first fruits. And that's of course true on the one hand, but it's definitely not enough. It's important for us to appreciate in the pagan mentality, while of course there was understandable concern to get the blessings, that was it. That was the only goal. And the development of these ceremonies, these rituals, were an attempt to, by some intricate and mysterious formula, get the bounty without actually doing anything in terms of an inner transformation. On the contrary, these rituals were often revoltingly cruel, inhuman, really disgusting. It didn't involve 
any inner transformation because it had nothing to do with the transformation of the person. It was simply a matter of securing the goods. The message of Deuteronomy chapter 26 is precisely the antithesis of that. We need to transform ourselves. Note, the ceremony takes place after the fruits have already ripened. They're not means to the end of getting the harvest. Rather, the harvest becomes means to expressing our thanksgiving and devotion to God. It's significant to note that, again, as I shared with you, there is no explicit reference in Deuteronomy chapter 26 at all to this holiday. In our tradition, one is only permitted to bring the first fruits to the Holy Temple in the ceremony described in Deuteronomy chapter 26 from the holiday of Shavuot. Again, the holiday that is identified in Numbers chapter 28 as the day of the first fruits, and on. Of course, and on, because many of the first fruits aren't ripe yet at this time of year. And the ceremony can be done any time over the course of the summer, but they can't be brought any earlier than this holiday. Why not? Because if you haven't gone through the counting of the seven weeks, if you haven't readied yourself through your efforts to see the material as means to the spiritual, to recognize that everything physical is only that means to something that goes beyond the physical, then you're not ready to bring the first fruits yet. You need to integrate that lesson before the first fruits can have indeed the effect on you that they need to because you've gotten yourself ready for it. This contrast between the perspective that we learn in the Torah and that pagan mentality is perhaps aptly expressed in yet another passage in the Torah that provides a striking and indeed very troubling contrast to this message. I'm referring to Numbers chapter 13, where we read of the sin of the spies. The association of the sin of the spies with this time of year is actually explicit in the story, because after we read of Moses' charge to the spies in their checking out the land, we read as a kind of dramatic aside in Numbers chapter 13, verse 20, now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes, first fruits, same expression, bikurim, that we encountered in the description of this holy day. And not only that, but apropos of the seven species that are used for the first fruits, in verse 23, we read, And they came unto the valley of Eshkol and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes. And they bore it upon a pole between two. And they took also of the pomegranates and of the figs. Grapes, pomegranates, figs. Sound familiar, don't they? They are all from among the seven species. So on the one hand, we have a mysterious, almost eerie reference, a veiled allusion to the bringing of the first fruits. But of course, it goes in a very, very different direction. When in the continuation of the story, the spies return, we read explicitly, the first thing they do is they showed them the fruit of the land. And then they said, verse 27, we came unto the land where you sent us, and surely it flows with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. This is the fruit of it. Take it. 
We're not going there. The people that dwell in the land are fierce. The cities are fortified and very great. Moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. We don't want it. Look at the fruit and forget it. Kalev tries to counter their report, saying we should go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. And the other spies, with the exception, of course, of Joshua, refuse to acquiesce. We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than, well, we can read the Hebrew either as than we or than he. And what results, of course, is the devastating debacle of the sin of the spies with its impact on that generation and on subsequent generations as well. All because, when we put this in context, they related to the fruit just as fruit. It was an end. It wasn't a means. All they have to say about the fruit is, yeah, the land flows with milk and honey. This is the fruit of it. Forget it. When you relate to the fruit as an end in itself, when you relate to the physical as just physical, then, of course, the moment there's any kind of spiritual challenge, there's no interest. Why bother? The whole message of the first fruit as presented in Deuteronomy chapter 26 is precisely the opposite. We're not looking at the fruit as the goal and the ritual as means to getting to that goal. On the contrary, the fruit of the means to connecting with God. Everything is means. Means ultimately to the spirit. We'll note one additional point in this regard, and that is a theme that is expressed both in the declaration that we make upon bringing the first fruits into the Holy Temple, and ironically by the spies as well. A land flowing with milk and honey. When you bring the first fruits to the Holy Temple, part of the declaration is, he has brought us into this place and has given us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Chapter 26 in Deuteronomy, verse 9. Well, as far as the spies are concerned, you may recall again, in chapter 13 of Numbers, in verse 27, surely it flows with milk and honey. Ah, yes, but we discussed this previously. Flowing is not a word that would usually be rendered in Hebrew, as it is here, as zavat. And yet that indeed is the expression that we find always with respect to the land that flows with milk and honey. The root of this word, Zov, appears indeed for the first time in the Bible when God makes known to Moses his mission. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 8, I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. But again, flowing is not usually zavat. Without belaboring this point, which we've discussed previously, the Hebrew zavat derives from a very different verb. It appears in the Bible in a number of contexts, never a natural flow. That is, one case in which it appears repeatedly is in Leviticus chapter 15, where the flow is an abnormal discharge that a man or a woman may experience what is rendered here as an issue. Zov, same root, definitely not a normal flow. It's something pathological. We also read of the same root in Lamentations chapter 4, verse 9, where the souls of those who are slain with hunger, who are dying of hunger, 
are described as draining, flowing away, stricken through. They're also obviously not a normal flow. And finally, we encounter the same root referring to a miraculous flow. In Psalm 78, verse 20, he smote the rock and waters flowed out. Likewise, in Psalm 105, verse 41, and similarly in Isaiah chapter 48, verse 21, always the water flowing from the rock is this same root coming from Zav Vayazuvu. In other words, Zavat Chalavud Vash, flowing with milk and honey, is not a natural flow. The land of Israel is not the land that epitomizes natural bounty. On the contrary, the material bounty of the land of Israel is a gift from above. You need to earn it. And the way you earn it is by recognizing that indeed it is exclusively a means to an end, never an end in itself. This lesson is one that is dramatically expressed with respect to this holiday in particular. And at this point, it behoves us to consider a strange recurrent theme that is highlighted in both of the principal discussions of this holiday in Leviticus chapter 23, in Deuteronomy chapter 16, and again, in speaking of the first fruits in Deuteronomy chapter 26, just consider in Deuteronomy chapter 23, once again, verse 21, you shall make proclamation on the self same day, there shall be a holy convocation unto you, the holiday. And the next verse, seemingly enigmatically, and when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corner of your field, neither shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the stranger. I am God your Lord. Similarly, and arguably even more explicitly, in Deuteronomy chapter 16, after you read that you shall make the Feast of Weeks unto God your Lord after the measure of the free will offering of your hand, the next verse, verse 11, and you shall rejoice before God your Lord, you and your son and your daughter and your manservant and your maidservant and the Levite that is within your gates, that is the itinerant teacher and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow that are in the midst of you in the place that God your Lord shall choose to call his name to dwell there. And you shall remember that you were a bondman in Egypt and that you shall observe to do these statutes. That is, you were in difficult straits. Remember that here. Because when you recognize that physical bounty is not the end point, it's the starting point, it's the means to the end, then the most important way of expressing that practically, tangibly, is are you using the material bounty to support the poor, to support the impoverished, to support the weak, to support the less fortunate members of society, if you're only supporting your family, your son, daughter, manservant, maidservant, you haven't gotten the message. Then you think that physical bounty is just for physical bounty. If you understand that it is means the spiritual, then when you give to the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, the widow, you're really getting something far, far more precious than the mere material gifts that you're giving away. Likewise, after we read of the dedication of the first fruits in the Holy Temple, what happens immediately afterward? In verse 11, in Deuteronomy chapter 26, and you shall rejoice in all the good that God your Lord has given you and unto your house, you and the Levite and the stranger that is in the midst of you once again. If it ends with you, you haven't really begun. You didn't get the message. Understanding what this Feast of Weeks is all about, 
understanding the growth process that the Feast of Weeks means is precisely recognizing that it is all in order to get to this goal, the spiritual goal, the goal that is expressed in your support for others, not you're taking it all for yourself. And this inevitably brings us, remember I, I said there were five explicit passages and two oblique ones, to the second and last oblique reference to this holiday. Again, a passage that does not in any way explicitly refer to this holiday. And yet, by implication, has everything to do with it. What we read in Exodus chapter 19. Now, the chronology, admittedly, is not explicitly articulated here. We read in the opening verse, in the third month after the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day, which presumably means the first day of the third month, they came into the wilderness of Sinai. Now what follows is a progression in verse 3. Moses went up unto God, and God called unto him out of the mountain. And indeed, in the continuation of the passage, we read of God saying unto Moses in verse 9, I am come unto you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you. And in verse 10, God says to Moses, go unto the people, sanctify them today and tomorrow and be ready for the third day. For the third day, God will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And Moses goes down and he doesn't say the third day. He says, be ready for three days. Come not near a woman. That is that both the men and the women need to prepare themselves separately for this great day. Now, when we consider the number of days that have passed here, it certainly seems very plausible, as our tradition preserves, that in as much as this holiday comes 50 days after Passover, Passover, remember, is the first month of the calculation. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 2, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first of the year to you. The third month, then, is the month in which this festival that takes place 50 days later, 50 days after the beginning of the festival of Passover, which is on the 15th day of the first month. Third month is when this festival will take place. Now, again, we don't have an explicit correspondence of dates here. I'll note further that this holiday is glaringly the only one that doesn't have an explicitly stated date in the calendar altogether. What I mean by that is every other holiday has a date, a month and a day in the month. This holiday is simply 50 days after the day after Passover. Now you might say, doesn't that give me an exact date? And the answer inevitably is, no, because when the calendar was not determined in advance by calculation, but rather by the testimony of witnesses who saw the new moon, this is the ideal mechanism for the determination of the beginning of months, because God involves us in providing the testimony, in making the declaration of the beginning of the month. The new moon plays the central role, but since the period between one new moon and the next is approximately just over 29 and a half days, 
any given month on average will be either 29 days long or 30 days long. Now, when you calculate from the 16th of the first month, then if by way of illustration, the first and second months are each 30 days long, then the 50th day would be on the fifth day of the third month. If they're both 29 days long, then the 50th day will be on the seventh day of the third month. If one is 30 and the other is 29, then it will be on the sixth day of the month. So this holiday can be on the fifth, sixth, or seventh day. So, of course, speaking of a commemoration of the actual date of the revelation of Sinai would be inevitably problematic since there isn't even a fixed date for the holiday. But then on further reflection, there also isn't any explicit date for the revelation either, which at first brush seems awfully strange. You would think that the event that is arguably the most significant event in all of human history, God's revelation to humanity, the giving of the Torah, would have a clearly identified date associated with it that we could commemorate for all generations. But of course, on further reflection, we can readily appreciate that that would really be missing the point. There is a danger that would inhere in focusing upon the giving of the Torah as a historical event, namely to relate to it as something that happened then to them as opposed to something that happens right now because every day of my life I receive from God the Torah his guidebook anew if we focus too much upon considering it as a historical event we're liable to lose sight of that and it is in that vein that it becomes particularly insightful to consider how this holiday relates to that revelation at Sinai. Now again, this is on some plane conjectural. It's based upon ancient tradition that we have, but it's not written explicitly in the Bible. But we have an ancient tradition that the exodus from Egypt took place on Thursday. Likewise, we have an ancient tradition that places the revelation at Sinai specifically on the Sabbath. Now, by quick addition, that clearly indicates that the date of the revelation would have been the 51st from the day after Passover rather than the 50th. The 50th day would have been Friday, not the Sabbath. So why am I speaking of the revelation at Sinai altogether as even pertaining to the fifth of, Feast of Weeks? And yet we do have this tradition of describing this festival as connected with the giving of the Torah, the revelation at Sinai. There are many answers to this question, but for our purposes at present, I think the one that inevitably presents itself, that begs to be considered here, is we're not commemorating what God did. We're not commemorating that it is on this holiday that God gave us the Torah, we're commemorating the process of preparation. 
we're commemorating Feast of Weeks. Those seven weeks of counting, one step after another, counting, making every step in this process count in growing, developing, moving toward coming to a state in which we will be readied for standing at the foot of Mount Sinai and receiving God's word. The commemoration is of the process, not the conclusion. What's most critical for us, again, is this lesson about our being active, our receiving everything that we receive from God, merely as means, as a summons. Now keep on going, keep on growing. Receiving the Torah, after all, also, is not an end point. It's a starting point. Once we receive the Torah from God at Sinai, it is, after all, a summons for life, to grow with it, to grow in it, to integrate it into our lives, to be transformed through it. It's always part of a process, a process in which we relentlessly need to play an active role. And it is inevitably on that note that I'd like to return one last time to Leviticus chapter 23 in our discussion today and consider one final motif that is perhaps the culmination of everything we've seen thus far. And that is when we consider the differences between the offering that is brought at the beginning of the 50 days and the offering that's brought on the festival of weeks after we've counted these weeks, after we've engaged in the whole arduous process of growth and development that seven complete weeks signifies as we have addressed separately in speaking of the counting of the Omer, when we consider the differences between these two offerings. So, one, of course, we have already noted this evening, and that is that when we speak of the offering brought at the beginning of this process, while admittedly, the Torah does not clarify the species involved. It just tells us, when you come into the land that I give you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then you shall bring an omer of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. So all that the Torah tells us is it's the first fruits of the harvest. But as we already noted, first fruits are barley. And besides the agricultural verity, that it is barley, again, I'm going to reiterate, as we see in the last verse of the first chapter of Ruth, in verse 22, they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of the barley harvest. Now, that's the barley harvest. In chapter 2, in verse 23, we read about the barley harvest and the wheat harvest. The wheat harvest happened after the barley harvest. So, once again, we reiterate that what we read in the description of the first offering brought at the beginning of this 50-day period on Passover is the offering brought from the first fruits of the harvest from barley. And, of course, as we have already noted, and this is fairly self-evident in any case, this offering necessarily is a meal offering that is not leavened. It certainly couldn't be leavened, considering that it is on the holiday of Passover. And on Passover, any leavened grain is completely forbidden. But besides the fact that it's Passover, we'll note the explicit prohibition stated in Leviticus chapter 2, verse 11, no meal offering which you shall bring unto God shall be made with leaven. 
So certainly this offering was an unleavened offering. And moreover, as we've already noted, barley for all intents and purposes was regarded principally as animal food. It's at the end of the 50 days that we read in verse 17, you shall bring out of your dwellings two wave loaves of two tenth parts of an ephah. They shall be a fine wheat flour. They shall be baked with leaven for fruit, first fruits unto God. And in verse 20, the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits for a wave offering before God. It's significant to note that both this offering and the Omer offering are described as first fruits, but of a very different sort. Besides the issues that we've already noted, barley, animal food, wheat for human consumption, we note the emphasis in verse 17 on these loaves being baked with leaven. This is not a violation of what we read in Leviticus chapter 2, verse 11, because indeed, as we read in verse 12, as an offering of first fruits, you may bring them unto God, but they shall not come up for sweet savor on the altar. And these two loaves were not placed upon the altar. But these two loaves do play a very significant role in the temple service in which they appear. And this is intimated in verse 16 when we read, you shall present a new meal offering unto God. Now, this is a subtle point, but I think it's an important one for us to appreciate. In verse 14, we read, and we've discussed this in the Count of the Omer, you shall eat neither bread nor parched corn nor fresh ears until this selfsame day, until you have brought the offering of your God. What do you mean? You're not supposed to eat at all? But of course, as we recognize, in as much as we're speaking in verse 10 of you're reaping the harvest of the land, that new harvest is not allowed to be eaten until this Omer offering is brought from the barley harvest at the beginning of the process. So that barley offering is necessary in order to permit the consumption of the new grain harvest by ordinary people in their homes. There is an interesting corresponding role played by the two loaves that are brought as offerings in the holiday of weeks. Described here again as a new meal offering unto God. Specifically, while from the bringing of the Omer offering, people are permitted to eat of the new harvest, they still are not allowed to bring of the new harvest as meal offerings in the holy temple. The new harvest can be used for meal offerings in the holy temple only after the bringing of this meal offering of fine flour on the holiday of Shavuot on the festival of weeks. Which at first brush may seem awfully strange. That is, the barley offering is enough that we can eat of it, but we can't bring of the new harvest as an offering to God until 50 days later. But upon further reflection, I think we can appreciate the message that God is conveying to us through this difference. Specifically, again, remember, the barley offering is the animal food level. It is when we're only starting out the process of growing. 
of rising spiritually through the material bounty that God has conferred upon us. Now, bringing that offering is a start, and it's significant as a start, but it's only a start. It makes a statement, and a statement that we recognize already elevates us beyond the mere animal that eats indiscriminately. We only eat of the new harvest after this offering is brought. And, you know, even though an animal eats indiscriminately, you can train an animal to not eat a particular food until the animal is given permission to eat of it. It's possible. Animals can be trained. And so the barley offering that is not leavened is the means through which the consumption of the new harvest is permitted to us ordinary people. But to bring a meal offering to the Holy Temple as an act of devotion to God, you can't train an animal to devote an offering to God, obviously. That's something only a human being could do. That's something that only becomes possible after you've gone through the long, arduous process of counting until you have come to the Feast of Weeks, until you have risen from an animal level, even a refined animal level, to a unique human level of bringing the fine flour, the wheat offering. It's a process. Only at the culmination of that process are you ready to dedicate yourself anew with a new harvest to God. And while, you know, inevitably there are many themes and symbolisms that the leavening invokes, maybe the one that is most relevant right now, as we conclude, is in order to produce leavened bread, besides yeast, and maybe even more important than the yeast, you need patience. It's a process. You can mix flour and water together and bake them at once, but then you'll only have unleavened bread. If you want to be able to get a leavened product, it's a process. You need to wait. You need for it to grow. And by implication, the symbolism here is you need to grow. You need to continue to develop. You need to recognize, once again, that harvest is a starting point, not an end point. And indeed, this is all implicit in speaking of the Feast of Harvest. Because we should have understood that, but maybe we didn't. And in case we didn't, it's important to introduce the theme of the first fruits that are brought from the wheat and leavened. And most critically, to introduce the theme of the Feast of Weeks, which stresses to us the harvest is just the beginning. We need to grow. We need to go. We need to start to count. We need to recognize that all of the material bounty is only means to a spiritual end. Everything that God gives us, we summon in order to come to him. It's all part of that ongoing dialogue through which we recognize in everywhere and everyone in the world who is lacking an opportunity for us to give it ourselves, to show how we have integrated and internalized this lesson, to show that the physical is only means to the spiritual, to show how everything that God gives us is a gift not to be rejected.
to be celebrated, but to be celebrated as means, as it were, to give it back to him. Not to surrender the physical, to elevate the physical. Not to repudiate life, to sanctify life, to sanctify everything in the world, everything that God gives us, to grow and keep on growing, to count and learn to make everything count in our dedication to him. May we have a blessed feast of weeks in internalizing this lesson and readying ourselves to receive God's boundless blessings. God bless you.